Evening, guys. So, uh, yeah, thanks for joining us tonight and uh, welcome to Sam, uh, who, <laughs> looking at the names on this call, one of the reasons we've we've sort of done this at this time of year is, um, you know, there's quite a lot of new people to TTT and certainly over the last couple of years, Sam uh, and his business partner, Jules, at Total Endurance Nutrition have been pretty prevalent on camps, on webinars, etc. And they've obviously been busy working with athletes all the way through the season this year. And we sort of get to this time of the year and we go, okay, there's quite a new lot of, you know, new intake of athletes for, for next year. So it's good to sort of put them back in, in front. So for those that do know Sam, um, uh, I'll get him to just do a little bit of a very brief intro on who he is exactly. Uh, so yes, those that know him just to, you know, excuse hearing it again, but there'll be plenty that, probably just need to know a little bit on his background and then um i'll let him get into the presentation um and uh, and then for those that obviously have met him loads of times i think this will be pretty interesting tonight you know sam's pretty good at sort of like you know he's so involved in what we're doing as a an overall business as one of the athletes he's well involved with you know what we do from coaching point of view so he's just right up to the minute with like what people are thinking about currently so uh, i think what he's going to talk about tonight will be uh, pretty relevant to the next few months for you. So, uh, yeah, Sam, I don't know if you just want to like give a bit of background on you and TEN quickly and then uh, head into it. Yeah. So, um, yeah, evening, everyone. Um, so basically, um, I suppose 10 is uh, one of the jobs that I do. Uh, my main job is um, at Liverpool John Moores University. So I'm a lecturer, sport and exercise nutrition so that's what I spend most of my time doing is teaching and most of my time doing research I would say um, in the sort of sport exercise nutrition and health domain really um, and then yeah total endurance nutrition was born as many things were during COVID um, between me and Jules and um, Jules is also at Liverpool John Moores University in the same department and um, there's also Kelsey, who's actually, I think, started at LGMU today, weirdly, as a, as a lecturer. Um, and then Vicky, who's based down south as well. So there's four of us as part of Total Endurance Nutrition now. Um, and yeah, I guess tonight is just trying to plant a bit of a seed um, in terms of prioritising um, recovery and um, around some of the key sessions and just thinking about how you might do that um particularly at this time of year where i think correct me if i'm wrong phil but we you know we're taking quite a polarized approach to training particularly at the moment with some high intensity you know key sessions during the week that we want to hit so thinking about how we recover from those is really important um but we'll get into that in the in the kind of presentation um what i would say is i pre-recorded this presentation so i'll play it but I've done that for the reason being that then if you've got questions that come up during the presentation, then feel free to put them in the chat. I'll try and respond to them as a go. If I feel it needs, you know, a, a verbal explanation, let's say, then I'll um, address those at the end as well for everyone um, to hear. Um, but yeah, so hopefully that's okay with everyone and we'll, uh, we'll press on um, with the presentation. Okay, so the focus of this evening's talk is going to be on nutritional strategies um, to optimise recovery. Uh, time of year, especially when we're doing quite periodised uh, training, so there's a lot of harder sessions uh, inters interspersed with, obviously, a lot of easier stuff as well, but it's important that we understand how we can maximize or optimize the recovery um, from those key sessions, because they're the ones that are going to help us progress in the sport. And, and I think it's a good opportunity as well during the winter to create some good habits around how we recover. So when we come into the summer and training volume might increase slightly, the proportion of time that we're spending you know, cycling, running, swimming is also going to increase potentially with longer sessions. And it's important we understand how we, we should recover from those uh, from those sessions. So this is, um, yeah, this is the focus of the talk tonight. And I suppose the first place to start is 
to answer this question as to why we should focus on recovery. And I think there's three key points here. So firstly, you know, if we have uh, a great, you know, a really good recovery strategy in place and we, we, we're able to recover well from the sessions that we're doing, then ultimately this is going to support the consistency of, of training. So we're able to roll from session to session to actually, you know, tie together session after session and um, week after week without getting injured or feeling hugely fatigued. And so, you know, this is important point, first of all, to focus on recovery for that, for that, uh, for that point. The second is that we can, you know, we focus on the recovery from our, our sessions and we can also enhance the quality of the, the key sessions or the next key sessions in the, in the week or in the, you know, the following week. And then finally, obviously the reason we're doing this is to ultimately improve our fitness, our ability to race you know, improve our health as well. And what we're doing when we're training is we're asking our body to adapt to that stress, that training stimulus that we're giving it. And the way we can actually optimize and enhance and make that adaptation and allow our bodies to adapt most effectively is by having also a lens on recovery and being able to recover uh, well from session to session. And of course, I'm speaking on behalf of Total Endurance Nutrition here. So, you know, a big part of recovery and what I'll hopefully show you in the, in, in the next few slides is that, you know, good nutrition and good nutritional habits are ultimately fundamental to how we recover. One thing I would say straight away is that recovery is, I, I think, even potentially um more valuable and having a lens on recovery is potentially more valuable for age group athletes compared to professional athletes. So if we think about professional athletes, they have a lot more time to rest, a lot more time to maybe prepare food, sleep in between sessions. And of course, you know, their requirement to recover is also important because they need to maybe, you know, probably be doing more strenuous training or more likely more training volume. So they need to recover from session to session just as you know much as we do. But they've got the opportunity to rest from session to session. Whereas, you know, as an age group athlete, we're trying to combine training with other life factors, you know, things like uh, family, we're trying to combine that with work, social commitments, and fit it into fit it into our diaries, into our days. And so making sure that we recover in the you know the window after training and we'll also talk about you know some other aspects of that around those key sessions having a focus on that is probably even more important for us than maybe for professional athletes i would say as well and if we think about you know recovery as a, a term there's many different strategies that we could employ um there's a lot of gadgets out there that help us you know optimize recovery in theory but for me the basis of optimal recovery is to get the nutrition correct <clears throat> and that doesn't just mean in the post exercise period you know having a protein shake after we've after we've done some training for example but it means you know from a day to day basis and on top of that if we can get enough sleep as well allowing our bodies to repair and recover whilst we sleep which is you know fundamental to those processes then that's the basis for for our recovery strategies of course there is a number of other strategies that we might see um you know on instagram things that might or might not have good evidence to support them and I, i've not tried to put these in any particular hierarchy because i don't really believe that there is a hierarchy for these but they all come after optimal nutrition and optimal sleep you know things like sports massage is is potentially important um wearing compression clothes or using normatec boots something like that you can do electro stimulation of muscle to help it recover we might do 
cold or uh, hot water immersion therapy to again optimize recovery at, you know when the time is appropriate and i think there's all these different strategies that we might you know might be able to use i'm even including supplements there because getting the basis of your nutrition right is key and then the the supplements are kind of well as as the term suggests in in addition to good nutrition or they're they're supplementing a good diet to maybe get a slight more benefit and we'll talk about some supplements again um later later in the talk as well but nutrition and sleep are essential to or are essential recovery strategies and that's where we should focus our time in terms of recovery so if we think about recovery itself then we tend to think about four four hours of recovery so the fundamental one of course is rest getting enough sleep um, from day to day and that's not always possible with family um, work commitments etc but that's you know we, we all know from a scientific perspective how important that is now the other three r's we could say are refueling so when we think about refueling we think about the key macronutrient there may be carbohydrate uh, and, and refilling of our glycogen stores in in the body which we'll talk about in a minute and um, we've also got rebuilding so rebuilding our muscles um which we tend to think of as you know protein being important for that and then also rehydrating so getting enough fluid to you know offset the the fluid that we've lost through sweating during a session for example so these are the four key key points really of recovery the four r's and we'll focus on the the refueling rebuilding and, and rehydrating um over the next uh few minutes so if we think about refueling um we, we start with the why why is it important to refuel and you know hopefully i'm not patronizing anyone here um, by saying that in the body we have obviously we've got fat stores even the most lean people have thousands and thousands of calories of fat available to them to use as, a, as an energy source during an exercise however carbohydrate stores and we're talking here about carbohydrate in the stored form which is glycogen are fairly limited in the body so in the liver we have about 70 to 100 grams of carbohydrate um, or, or glycogen uh, and in muscle we've got maybe four five maybe 600 grams of um, glycogen uh, available to us when we're kind of fully loaded let's say and so you've got there about two and a half thousand calories worth of energy available to you to to you know and obviously we don't want to maximally deplete those stores at any time either but the key point there is that those those stores are fairly limited so obviously during exercise we're going to use, you know, we're going to use glycogen from both the liver and the muscle. And how much glycogen we actually use is obviously dependent on both the intensity of the, the training session that we're doing and also the duration of the session. So we take a, you know, take a look at some examples here. So a 30 to 60 minute easy run is fairly low levels of glycogen being used. A 45 to 60 minute big gear session, for example, uses a little bit more. There's still some glycogen use going on there because the sort of strength element of the big gear session requires glycogen as, a, as an energy source, particularly from muscle. If we do a, a long duration endurance ride, two, three, four hours plus, then the intensity is lower, but the duration of that ride necessitates that the overall glycogen cost of that session is quite high. And then, you know, right at the top of that, we're thinking about a sort of um, 60 to 90 minute, maybe threshold or VO2 max session that, that is highly glycogen dependent from both the liver and, and muscle. So it's important to refuel and refuel those, you know, glycogen stores in both the liver and the muscle in particular um, following following training and that's you know what we think about in terms of recovery uh, in terms of refueling so how much carbohydrate well we need about one to 1.2 grams of carbs per kilo body weight per hour in the in the first few hours following a session and that'll depend on how you know glycogen dependent that session was of course as we alluded to on the previous slide 
timing. I've put less than one hour post session here because the the aim of this talk is to is to get us to think about how important that one, maybe two hour period following a session, um, how important that time period is to optimize our recovery. So we, you know, we you might have heard of um, this window of opportunity and whether or not it exists is um, still debatable, I think. Um, in, and in some aspects it probably does and in some aspects it probably doesn't matter too much. But because I'm talking here to busy age groupers, then we need to think about recovering and taking on some carbohydrate in that post-exercise period because it's quite easy for it to, you know, when life gets in the way, it's quite easy for that to then extend out to maybe three hours later before we start to think about eating something or eating a substantial amount of food that's going to help refill those muscle glycogen and liver glycogen stores. So I think having a good strategy to follow in the hour following, you know, a hard training session is important and, and something to think about implementing. And so what type of carbohydrate should we be focusing on? So if we think about every day, daily lives, then high fiber, complex carbohydrates are generally the way to go. So we're talking there, you know, whole wheat pasta, um, brown rice, wholemeal bread, those sorts of things. When it comes to refueling, then we want something that's much more simple, less processing required by the body, taken up faster from the gut, and it gets quickly to the muscle and to the liver to replenish and refill those glycogen stores. An important point to think about here as well is that we want a combination of glucose and fructose in that you know, meal, drink following the, the training. The reason for that is that glucose is predominantly used to refill muscle glycogen stores, whereas fructose is predominantly used to refill liver glycogen stores. We also, you, you may or may not know, but you know, glucose and fructose use two different transport proteins in the gut. And so that means that we can take on more carbohydrate, refill both of those stores more effectively when we combine glucose and fructose rather than just simply having glucose or fructose in that post-exercise period. So a couple of examples there, and we like to you know, focus on, if we can, re real food in this case, something fairly quick to you. So on the, on the left-hand side here, we've got maybe something like half a can of rice pudding, simple carbohydrate sauce, a banana, a couple of tablespoons of honey, both the banana and honey are high in fructose, the rice pudding high in glucose, about 84 grams of carbohydrate in total, and that hits our 1.2 grams of carbs per kilo body weight per hour. On the right-hand side, another option like a bagel, again, white bagel with sliced apple and syrup on top, a handful of raisins, again, we're up to around 85 grams of, of carbohydrate for this, for this typical 70 kilo individual. So those are two approaches to, that we can use to refuel. So rebuilding, so why focus on rebuilding? Well, you know, we can take the analogy of a, of a, a rusty drivetrain, let's say, um, or a messy drivetrain. And this might be what our drivetrain is like at the end of a session. And so what do we do? Well, we clean that drivetrain after a, after a hard session. We might replace some of the, um, some of the uh, links in that drivetrain if, if necessary. Um, but ultimately what we're aiming to do is get this nice clean drivetrain by the end of the recovery period. And this is what we, you know, looking for in terms of optimized recovery. And this analogy kind of holds true when we think about what we are using to clean or replace the damaged elements of our drivetrain um, or our muscle. And what we're thinking about there is protein. And, and ultimately, when we think about protein, protein is, you know, made up of a number of amino acids. And they're the kind of building blocks, if we like. They're the kind of the links in the chain um, that we that we piece together to create 
new protein in the muscle and rebuild and recover our muscles following a session. You know, and typically we think about protein intake as being important if we want to build muscle um, and, and grow our muscles. But it's also important from a recovery perspective as well to recover those muscles and help them, you know, help, you know, reduce soreness, for example. One thing that people don't always consider is that we also need protein to build other elements of the muscle as well, such as the mitochondria and Mitochondria are absolutely critical because they're the organelle that helps us oxidize both fats and proteins, also deal with lactate as well. Um, and so having an abundance of mitochondria, um, having you know functioning mitochondria is critically important um, to the recovery process. And protein and amino acids are also, you know, the building blocks for those mitochondria as well as the sort of um, the muscle um, fibers themselves. Okay, so what about the recommendations from a protein perspective? Well, you know, after after training, we want maybe twenty to to forty grams of protein, depend you know depending on how much lean mass you have generally. But that's the that's the ballpark figure where we get um, optimal kind of protein um, building or protein synthesis. Again. We talked about that window of opportunity, whether it exists or not, but we're talking here about some strategies in, in people's busy lives. So maybe in that hour following a session, we want, you know, about 20 to 40 grams of protein. And ideally what we want is a protein that has a high number or a blend of amino acids. And one of the, one of the best or, or, or the best protein in that respect is probably whey protein. That has almost, you know, that has the full blend of um, amino acids that, that our body requires. It's always important to consider as well that people might follow a plant-based diet, vegan diet, and there are, you know, vegan proteins available. Okay, they don't have the full blend of amino acids, but I think those products are improving. They're never going to have the full blend of amino acids simply because they're not, you know, it's not available to get those amino acids from all um plant sources but you know generally you will you will be able to get a high quality vegan protein now as well and then we can look at other you know other um and, and i've included here things that are fairly easy to grab and go let's say things like protein yogurt eggs and um, protein bars chicken sausages are you know something quite straightforward to use as well um, even beef jerky, all these things high in protein and, and easy to grab if, if you're in a rush and, and use to, to support that rebuilding process. One thing that's important to say here is that if we, you know, we can re refuel and rebuild at the same time here. And there's actually a benefit to doing that because when you combine the carbohydrate and the protein, it actually enhances the the refilling of the muscle glycogen stores after exercise so there's been a number of studies that have shown this that show if you have carbohydrate versus carbohydrate protein you get a greater you know um, muscle glycogen um refilling occurring when you combine carbohydrate and protein versus carbohydrate only there is supplements or products on the market that allow us to combine these two so such as um, science and sport rego here what i would say is that whilst that's hitting the protein target of, you know 20 grams of protein the carbohydrate target which we might aim to be more we'll put like 60 or 70 grams of carbs is isn't quite there so you'd have to combine that with like a banana or something like that after um yeah, after a session to get the, the optimum carbohydrate and protein um, quantity that you require. A really cool way to do this and um, efficient way is actually to use something much cheaper and just chocolate milk. <clears throat> and chocolate milk has this sort of three to one ratio of carbs to protein, which is what we sort of tend to think has been optimal for, for recovery. So about 60 to 60 grams of carbs, 20 grams of protein. If you've got time, then we can obviously, you know, um, think about using real food, which is always the preference really, because there's that satiating effect of real food as well. 
Um, so something like Greek yogurt with, uh, you know, a granola, banana, honey. And there, you know, we're getting there, the protein, we're getting a combination of um, glucose and fructose as well to refill both the carbohydrate stores and the production stores in the muscle and also in the liver. So finally, rehydration. Obviously, we're trying to, you know, replace fluid and electrolytes lost through sweating through uh, rehydration, re rehydration strategies. And from a recovery perspective and supporting the other two um, aspects of recovery as well, rehydration is important because when we are dehydrated after a session, then what we get is a decrease in blood volume occurring. Now, a decrease in blood volume is, is important because we need adequate blood volume. So we need, you know, a good level of blood volume essentially to help optimize our recovery. The reason for that is that having adequate blood volume allows blood flow to uh, be optimized. And that means that when we ingest our protein and our carbohydrates taken up from the gut, having adequate blood flow, because we've got ad adequate blood volume, will mean that the delivery of those nutrients in the blood to the muscle and also to the liver is, is optimal. So isn't isn't being impaired essentially. And what that means is that we, you know, we've got good delivery of amino acids to the muscle. Um, and we've also got delivery of glucose to um the muscle to, to refill muscle glycogen stores and also delivery of fructose to, to refill liver glycogen stores as well. So if we're trying to what we want to try and do, I suppose, is avoid ending a session in a dehydrated state. And that's one of the reasons, obviously, to drink during a session, not only because we're going to feel rotten, we're probably going to have a headache, um, we're going to have salt all over our clothes. But the point being is that if we maintain a good level of hydration or minimise the dehydration that we incur, then we shouldn't impact recovery too much Um with a focus on those other two R's, those, that rebuilding and refueling aspect. So in terms of rehydration, how much do we need to drink? Well, in theory, over the sort of one to two hours following a session, we should aim at about 150% of fluid loss. So if, you know, if we lose um, one litre of sweat during a session, then we want to drink 1.5 uh, liters in the one to two hours following that session and you know we should be focused on there on water and electrolytes and this is probably a good opportunity to obviously talk about precision hydration which is obviously one of the partners with ttt and even i think within ttt now we've got the opportunity to do some sweat testing with with sean down at the the farm club as well um to understand not only our well, our sweat rate, but also, you know, more importantly, the concentration of our sweat. And um, so whether we need to have higher um, electrolyte requirements during and, and after the after the session itself. Okay, so just to kind of summarize the points up to that point up to this uh, point of the talk, we're, you know, ultimately we're, we're focused on recovery from the perspective of you know, what are we doing after a session? So we're, you know, whether that's cycling, swimming, running, we're in the gym, then we're, you know, thinking about what can we do after that session in terms of protein intake, in terms of carbohydrate intake, which, you know, the requirements will be dependent on the session, our fluid intake um, in that post-exercise period. But, we can also think about and should be thinking about how we can kind of get ahead of the game here. So we should be thinking about what can we do during a session to optimize the recovery from that session? Also, what should we do in the hours before that session to make sure that we recover appropriately from the session as well? And we can even think about what should we be doing in the days before a session that will mean that we recover better from that key session that we're going to hit. And the umbrella term for, for what we're doing 
in the days or hours or even during a session is is this idea of pre-recovery. So what are we doing before and during a session to optimize recovery? And we can combine, you know, our pre-recovery and our recovery um, strategies as well. But the, the pre-recovery aspect is just something that we'll focus on for this next part of the talk. So some pre-recovery strategies, and this is, you know, there's, there's probably a few more that I've missed out here. I've tried to focus on things that have a good scientific basis behind them and simple things to implement as well. Um, but there is probably other things that might be specific to certain individuals, um, which you know re potentially require um, some more discussion. So one of the things that I try and push athletes to think about here is having adequate carbohydrate intake during a session. Now that's going to depend what your or your carbohydrate intake during a session is obviously going to be dependent on how carb um, heavy that session might be. So. Very simply, if we take, you know, a session where we're aiming to create a metabolic adaptation, so something like improving fat oxidation, where we're riding for two or three, four hours outside, then having some carbohydrate during that session is going to be useful. So maybe like 40 to 60 grams of carbs per hour. Obviously, we go to the other kind of other end of the spectrum where we're doing a maybe a 45, 60, 90 minute threshold or VO2 max session, then the carb requirements for that session are much higher. And fueling it higher will, will also mean that we recover from that session better. So, you know, something like 70 to 100 grams of carbs per hour is probably a good, a good way to approach that session. The reason for that is that, well, firstly, we take an adequate carbohydrate that we can spare our liver glycogen better so we're not impacting our liver glycogen stores so heavily by by fueling correctly one thing that's a bit of a misconception is that when we ingest carbohydrate we spare our muscle glycogen well actually that's not necessarily true we still use our muscle glycogen but we're, what we do is spare our liver glycogen um we also you know by fueling appropriately we reduce the calorie deficit that's induced by exercise and you know whether that's whether our aim of a session is to create you know support weight loss then it's much better to to fuel these sessions appropriately because then you will minimize the kind of exercise induced um effects on appetite after a session as well so if you don't fuel a session well you'll get off the bike maybe half an hour, an hour later, you're absolutely ravenous and you overcompensate. Um, so by fueling appropriately, then that overcompensation won't, won't be an issue and you'll, you'll eat to your requirements, essentially. Um, if we think about stress, and stress is quite a broad term, but what we want to think about is minimising the bad stress on the body. So by creating a huge deficit and you might term it putting ourselves in the hole or if you listen to joe skipper the k-hole then that's what we want to avoid so by again fueling that session appropriately we're minimizing that that stress on the both uh, on the body and ultimately you know if we fuel the session well then we're also going to execute a high quality session or give ourselves the best chance of executing a high quality session um, as well so it's important to think about what you're doing from a carbohydrate perspective during a session and it needs to match the, the requirements of that session as well. One thing that's apparent from a number of studies now is that most people don't get enough protein in their diets. And that's particularly true for people who are you know, training 8, 10, 12 upwards uh, hours per week. Um, and we always have this hierarchy in terms of protein. So getting enough protein in your diet is, is essential because as we talked about at the start, it's going to support recovery from, you know, recovery from the sessions, but it's also going to, um, you know, optimize is the basis for our basis for our diet. Essentially it's, it's the, the foundation of a good diet. It's, you know, number of processes that protein supports in the body is, is huge. Um, so getting the amount of protein right first is important. And 
for people who are active, then we should be aiming at 1.5 to 2 grams of protein per kilo of body weight. So if we take a 70 kilo individual, you're looking at about 105 to 140 grams of protein per day. Now, how we get that and how we um, have that through the day is also important and can also be optimized to support recovery or pre recovery. So typically, simply because the pattern of our diet in Western society is that we have a fairly small breakfast, lunch is a bit bigger, and then all of our, you know, many of our calories come in the evening when we sit down maybe as a family um, and, and have a big meal together. And so what we see is a skewed distribution of, well, energy intake, but also protein intake. So at breakfast, we have typically um, protein um, intake is fairly small, again, slightly more at lunch, and then a lot of the protein comes at dinner. And this is what we call like a skewed distribution. But this we know from a number of studies is not optimal to support, you know, athletic um, performance and recovery. So the better way to approach this is to have a, a regular and even distribution of protein intake through the day. So, you know, having sort of maybe 20, 30, 40 grams, depending on your body weight at uh, at breakfast, a uh, mid-morning snack, the same at lunch, a mid-afternoon snack, and then um, as your evening meal. And then even maybe, you know, if needed, uh, a protein a protein before bed as well. Um, and this will just depend on how, how big you are, you know, your body size, essentially, how much you weigh. But this is, you know, a much more even distribution and is the optimal uh, protein distribution to support recovery from the training that you're doing support daily life essentially and, and make sure you maintain your muscle mass um throughout the training as well so a few kind of supplements now that we we think we should um also include in terms of pre-covery strategies now vitamin d we're obviously all aware that this time of year there's very little daylight um, particularly this last week where it seems to be or these last few days where it seems to be really misty during you know even during the day even during light hours um, and so supplementing with vitamin D is becomes really important so about 20% of the UK population have vitamin D deficient which I'd be surprised if it's not a little bit higher than that to be honest um, but from an athletic perspective um, we know that being deficient in vitamin D, you're not getting enough vitamin D, is associated with greater rates of injury. And it also means that it takes longer to recover from injury and, and also, you know, training as well. And so we also know from a, a lot of research now that the recommended dose of um, vitamin D is around 1,000 to 4,000 uh, international units. Um, and you should take vitamin D3 in this case um, daily. So that's the recommended dose. And, and why is that important? Well, for a number of reasons. Firstly, it's important for muscle regeneration. It supports muscle uh, regeneration and recovery. Um, also bone health and, and bone regeneration as well. Um, and then also it supports uh, optimal mitochondrial function as well. So again, as I talked about at the start, this these mitochondria are incredibly important for athletic performance. They they help us burn the carbohydrates and, and fat. So having functioning mitochondria is you know essential to to the to the training that we're doing. And, and so getting optimum vitamin D is is going to support that. One of the ones that's become quite popular in the last few years and it is used across a number of sports is either beetroot juice or cherry juice. So, you know, the two uh, kind of products that we might see on the shelf or online, are, are this, this beat it, these beat it shots, or we have these gels, these cherry active gels that um, both have around 30 mils um, of the sort of active ingredient in them. And, we know from 
quite a large number of studies now in the literature that they can, you know, impact many aspects of recovery. So they can sort of attenuate muscle damage from if we're thinking about strength training, particularly eccentric strength training, then it can start to attenuate some of that damage that we cause through that. Um, might be particularly important when you come to do something like the rock or um, the rock events where you're, you're running downhill, which is eccentric um, loading of, of the muscles. Um, it can reduce muscle soreness as well and accelerate sort of strength recovery. However, so the, these are these are all positive things, of course. However, what we also know is that it reduces markers of inflammation and oxidative stress. Now, that sounds like a good thing, and it is to a degree. However, oxidative stress in particular is important and is an important component of how our muscles and our bodies adapt to the training that we're doing. So when we train, we create oxidative stress, and that's an important signal for the body to adapt to the session that we're doing. So what I would suggest is that either beetroot or cherry juice isn't necessarily suitable on a, you know, on a daily basis um, during specific training blocks when we're trying to create adaptation, we're trying to improve both metabolic and physiological adaptations to um, or, or get those adaptations to the training that we're doing because we need some oxidative stress from those sessions as a as a as a stimulus to to create that adaptation beetroot or cherry juice though could be important uh around competition so if you you know if you think about your next race then the recommendations would say that you'd have two shots per day probably one in the one in the morning one in the evening of, of the beat it or the cherry active and you have that in the three to five days before your race and then three three to four days following the race as well and that will help to improve some elements of recovery so if we think about the damage that racing can cause on our muscles the soreness that we get um you know recover some of the strength that we that we lose when we race as well so my suggestion for for this strategy is to use this specifically around around um, competition and, and, and key races um, where we're tapering, we've got the adaptation already. So, you know, the training we're doing is just managing and um, preparing us for that event. And, and therefore we're not impacting the, the adaptation to, to the training because we've already got it. And then a final one that I want to quickly talk about is, is based on some research that us and couple of other universities in the UK have also done and it is using this anthocyanin which is a anthocyanin is a, a polyphenol basically um which is high in fruit and vegetables in general and anthocyanins in particular are high in in sort of dark colored fruit so such as blackcurrant and New Zealand blackcurrants have the highest concentration of anthocyanins of any fruit um in the world essentially um and there's a supplement now that's been generated from this, from these anthocyanin-rich black currants. Um, the, the, the good stuff essentially is extracted and put into a capsule form um, to create um, currants or these New Zealand black currant extract capsules, essentially. And we've done a few different studies on these capsules. So we did a study a few years ago with Jules um, that showed that it improves fat oxidation, so fat burning during exercise, and that's been replicated by a number of other studies as well, um, in both males and in females. Um, but one of the studies that we've been doing recently um, is showing that, and what, and what we've seen is that, um, or what we're interested in is how um, whether the whether the blackcurrant extract can help us refill our muscle glycogen stores when we when we have not enough carbohydrate intake, so we just this is like preliminary data, but what it's showing us is that when we um, do a bout of exercise, we burn um, muscle glycogen. Um, this was a heavy bout of exercise that burnt muscle glycogen, so you get very low levels immediately following the exercise at this zero time point in the middle of the slide. Um, we then fed 
a suboptimal quantity of carbohydrates. So in this case, if you think back to the optimum, was about 1 to 1.2 grams per kilo body weight per hour. Here we did about 0.8 grams per kilo per, per hour, which is about 60 grams of carbs per hour. So still fairly high when, by the end of the four hours, because that's about 240 grams of carbs by the end of the four hours, which is an awful lot of carbohydrate, but nowhere near even what we see people actually doing in, in real life. So we've gone for a suboptimal amount of carbohydrate here, but it isn't actually, you know, it's still higher than what we what we see people do in real life, I would say. Um, and we we tracked muscle glycogen levels after one hour and then after four hours of recovery. And what we showed was that when people had used a blackcurrant extract supplement for seven days prior to this exercise and, and then this uh, carbohydrate feeding, they actually accelerated um, the rate at which the muscle glycogen stores were being refilled compared to a placebo or you know a control condition so it seems to have some benefits to supporting muscle glycogen refilling after strenuous exercise and alongside that there's been a few studies now that show that it can also reduce muscle soreness and also accelerate the recovery of strength following following training as well um, and we're adding to that to show that you can accelerate the refilling of, of glycogen stores as well so there's potential for this, you know, I, I think there's good, there's quite a body of research now, quite a big body of research that shows many positive benefits for recovery um, and performance. And it comes under this, you know, idea of pre-recovery because there's a period of days where you where you need to load with it to, to see the benefit. What I would actually say is the recommended use would be taking one to two capsules per day, which is slightly dependent on, um, your weight so large people can get away with one capsule two capsules for heavier people um, and you will get these benefits um, in terms of you know accelerating the recovery and also you know refilling of glycogen stores after hard exercise as well okay so just to try and summarize and bring that together first of all we talked about recovery strategies the four r's and particularly the, I suppose, the three R's of refueling, rebuilding, and rehydrating. And we've, you know, thought about that as what are we doing after the exercise session itself. But the second half, we've we've talked about what we can do beforehand, and, and this idea of pre-recovery. So, you know, we can think about protein distribution and getting enough protein in days and hours, and also even during the session as well, if it if it, you know, allows it. And some sessions will will allow that fluid intake is obviously important as well and then i've also put carbohydrate you know in the hours and during a session you know in the hours before a session and also during a session but of course your carbohydrate requirements are going to depend on the the session that you're actually doing here as well so it's important to think about that we've also got some other strategies so something like vitamin d is probably important to supplement with at this time of year especially um, I think there's enough evidence to show that using currents is also a good strategy and has a number of benefits to recovery as well. And then finally, we can we can think about using around competition only though, um, something like cherry juice or or beetroot juice in the period and in the days leading up to an event and also in the few days following an event as well. So. That's the, I guess, the summary from this talk and that summary slide that you feel free to take a picture of um, as to what we're talking about in terms of pre-recovery, getting ahead of our recovery, um, and then the recovery strategies that we can follow after a session as well. And putting this together is ultimately going to mean that the training that we do is better, is a higher quality of training, we roll from session to session, so consistency is improved. And the adaptation that we get to that training is also, you know, optimal as well. It's enhanced. So that's the that's what we need to think about when, you know, we're thinking about recovery and pre-recovery strategies for, for training. And we should almost think about recovery as an extension of the session itself, I think. So 
just as just as you might think about I've been for a run and you know I need to stretch now that should become part of your recovery strategy and part of the session then we should also think about what we're doing from a nutrition perspective to support the session that we've just done or, or the session that we're going to do obviously if you you want any more information or um the, about about some particular strategies here or our general advice then of course feel free to contact me or, or visit the website um totalendurancenutrition.com thanks for that sam no worries and just just for anyone that hasn't used the chat button on here as well it's worth diving in there and just reading the thread there's some good questions posed during that so uh, and sam's answered them so uh yeah and if you want to open the floor sam see if anyone yeah i mean if, you, if there's any other questions then feel free to well put them in the chat or just come on and ask you're going to address were you going to address one that was asked earlier on i think yeah i think so you asked about was it how much carbohydrate you know should we be taking on and i sort of answered it a little bit in that presentation but from uh from a metabolic perspective, I suppose it's worth thinking about. So I think you asked about how much you are taking in versus how much you are actually burning. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, so the 90 grams per hour, which is that upper limit that everyone talks about, is based on the fact that um, there's quite a few research studies now that show that if you um, or when you ingest carbohydrate at high rates, then typically the maximum you can burn is 1.5 grams of carbohydrate per minute so then obviously times by 60 that's 90 grams per hour what has been a little bit lost in translation is that you need to actually to achieve those rates of oxidation at that 1.5 grams per minute you actually need to take on about 100 and five to 120 grams of carbs per hour so the the rate of intake versus what's been burned it's not like you know one to one basically it's um yeah it's a little bit more than that so if you want to get the highest rates of carbohydrate burning and the burning being 90 grams per hour that you're burning then you actually need to take on about 105 to 120 grams per hour to to achieve that does that answer you your question phil yeah i suppose like when i was looking at um carbohydrate oxidization when we measure it in the lab you know you're seeing it at quite high rates when it's at high power at three four five bigger on re on the you know grams per minute uh and it's more just the realization of in certain sessions you can be burning very high numbers of carbohydrate through the so even if you're fueling at 90 grams an hour in a, in a hard workout, you still, you haven't replaced everything from that workout and therefore post recovery fueling becomes important. Yeah. Yeah. So you could yeah. theoretically be burning way, way more than 90 grams an hour. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, I can't remember the, the exact numbers for you, but yeah, mo yeah. To, you know, sort of a fairly intense session. You're going to be somewhere between, probably two and a half up to four grams per minute that you're burning four grams is a lot but yeah somewhere between two and a half three and a half grams per minute so you can immediately see that you're nowhere near replacing what you're burning in that sense yeah so if you think about those hard threshold sessions sweet spot sessions that sort of thing they're very carb dependent but you're you're still in a bit of a deficit afterwards as yeah, well. They just they just simply have to be fueled. You can't yeah. even in three by twenty minutes, which could be done in an hour and twenty on the turbo. Even if you think you can get through it without fueling, it's suicide because you've burnt hundreds of grams of carbohydrate. And those I just always see with athletes this slight tendency to there's a, always a slight diet mentality going on, and you can't do that when you're doing the hard sessions. You've got to replace what's being burned uh, uh, as much as possible because you're burning even more. So I think I think that's driven a lot by the fact that people, you know, generally you would say if your diet is good, then you will have enough glycogen in the muscles and the liver to actually execute that session. But that that is just taking that session as a, you know, a standalone session, irrespective of all the other sessions you're doing before and afterwards. So by fueling that specific session well and taking on carbs during it, 
the point is, as I, as I made in the presentation, that you're you, there's still a new, you know there still needs to be a focus on the recovery afterwards. But you're taking, um, yeah, you're not putting so much stress on the body where you've induced this massive deficit um, on the body to actually, yeah, you, um, you, you're going to recover a lot faster essentially. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, um, a couple of quick questions just oh, uh the lactic acid tablets yeah i'm not really sure it's certainly not uh the oh, same as the currants and cherry supplements no it's a it, but buffering of lactate's been around for donkey's years using sodium bicarbonate uh in a really simple form which you know most people if you spoon a load of that into your mouth you'll be vomiting pretty quickly um uh, and um uh, the idea of, uh, I just think, so you have to be doing some, you know, if you're racing a 70.3 or an Ironman, trying to buffer lactate for, in the race isn't really that important because you're not creating, I mean, it's essentially hydrogen ions you're trying to buffer, isn't it? And, and you're not creating them at a point that will be rising exponentially in the blood. So for the type of, certainly for the type of racing we're doing, I'm not, you know, if you were doing an awful lot of VO2 work or something, then there may be some benefit to trying to buffer some hydrogen ions to get yourself through those sessions a little bit better. It's not quite the same, but we had a question in the chat about the creatine as well, which is, is kind of along similar lines. It's about thinking about what what the aim of the sessions are and what sessions you're actually doing that require that buffering as well. There's not many sessions really that are going to require that buffering. The same with creatine. There's not many sessions that are going to require that explosive power um, that, that you're going to generate with some creatine. Um, so I think you can be a bit selective with the supplements that you use. Yeah. And, um, the, and the timing around them is. Yeah. Really yeah. Um, um, one of the, yes, uh, Simone, I'll answer your question about, caffeine and coffee so i've talked talk about a study that we've done using currents to help promote glycogen resynthesis after exercise and there's actually a, a study that um from 2008 that shows that you can actually achieve the same thing with um caffeine as well so yes absolutely and it, this links quite well to another question on fasted training so for example say you did a fasted session in the morning um you know, a bit of a longer, more endurance sort of type session. And then you had your breakfast with, with your coffee that might promote, you know, glycogen resynthesis. What I would say is you don't really want to be using caffeine or coffee if you've done the hard session in the evening, because that's obviously going to impact your sleep. Um, so generally caffeine, we tend to say, try and stop drinking after sort of two, three, 4 PM, depending on your tolerance levels anyway. Um, so there is, yeah, there is, there is a place for caffeine and coffee and during recovery, I think, but in the morning, of course, it's a diuretic. So you also need to think about hydration and probably have more of a lens on hydration there. So I've said 150% of um, fluid loss is what you want to try and replace over the, in the, in the first few hours following a session. So that also requires that you, you think about and understand what your sweat rate is as well, um, which you can measure very easily just by weighing yourself before and after and taking into account how much fluid you've drunk during that session to to calculate your sort of sweat rate and sweat loss um so I'm just quite... a couple of athletes have spoken about sweat rate sweat loss etc and they tend uh, over the last few weeks in various comms i've had and they tend to be athletes slightly newer to ttt over time we have done uh, like a zwift session with everyone on a saturday in the winter measuring sweat loss which I think you were involved in um, and we've got a protocol for it. And I think over the, over the course of January, February, we'll roll this out again. So uh, it's easily done at home to get a bit of data on yourself. And I think it's just good bit of education, isn't it? For athletes to understand. Yeah. And I think it's important to do that during the off season in particular, because we're on Zwift a lot of the time and no doubt sweating an awful lot. You also need to do that when it comes around to race season and do it in the more, you know, outside basically when you're doing more race specific sessions, because it, you know, you could have very different sweat rates um being outside, especially when it's freezing cold um at the moment. Um yeah, the other question was on faster training, and I, I sort of answered it a little bit. Um, 
I think faster training, the, the reason we do it generally is to try and improve our ability to burn fat. Um, and it's most suitable during those endurance or easy type sessions, which are, you know, not dependent on fat, but fat makes a larger proportion of the energy that we, that we use to uh, fuel those sessions. Um, the harder sessions you can do faster if you want to like early morning, sometimes, you know, just for, for lifestyle or, you know, work, getting it in before work. I know I do a lot of my training in the morning and some of it ends up being fastered for that reason. But it's only those easier sessions that I really do truly fasted where I'm not taking on any fuel during the session. I might start it fasted, um, but you might need to then fuel it uh, for the harder sessions as well. Um, so I think it, it's very dependent on what your goals are. Um, it can be useful to promote fat burning and teach your body to burn fat better, which is really important when, you know, for endurance performance. Um but you also need to balance that with the type of session that you're doing. So the easier endurance stuff, fine. You can do a, some or all of that session faster, depending on how long it is. Harder sessions, and as we've talked about before, you need to start fueling those. Um, even if you get on the bike first thing uh, as you roll out of bed, make sure you start fueling those, those harder sessions. Yeah, good. Any, anything from anyone else? No, good. Good. Thanks, Sam, for that. I mean, I think it just provides loads of good thoughts for, um, you know, the next few months for people. Uh, Sam's obviously put his contact details on there. Um, you know, I'm sure just fire him a fire them an email or anything. If you've got any questions on anything, um, they're normally pretty quick at getting back to you. Happy to help. Um, and um, yeah, um, yeah, I'm sure we'll be doing something else, something else again soon. I think we'll set that sweat test up. I think that sort of interests yeah. people. As a, it's like a session with a with a point to your, your session, so a reason to sweat a lot. So uh, yeah, good, good, and uh, yeah, guys, thanks very much for joining uh, and and taking part as well. It really it really helps these sessions when athletes like are um, taking part and asking questions. As ever, Chris Keeling always very keen to ask questions. So. But it does. It helps a lot. It helps a lot. So uh, be be more, Chris. Uh, cool. Cheers, guys. Thanks very much. Thanks, guys.